Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage founder of Identiverse and founder and CEO of Ping Identity, Andre Durand, and founder of Cyber Risk Alliance, Doug Manoni. Welcome to Identiverse. It's great to have you guys all back here in Denver, and it feels like we've got our community back. I'm delighted to be here on stage with my partner, Doug Manoni. Wow, it's exciting to be here. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you, Doug. When I founded the conference in 2010, I had a vision of bringing together the community who would make the dream of identity a reality. As the conference grew, it became apparent to me that the community required a stewardship and a focus uh, that simply Ping could not give it as a project that we were trying to fit in day to day. So it is with great pleasure that I share the relationship we've created with Doug and the Cyber Risk Alliance team. Under CRA stewardship, I'm confident that Identiverse will reach its potential of becoming the preeminent identity industry conference. Andre, my colleagues and I are deeply respectful of what you and the team at Ping have accomplished here. Um, as the new owners of Identiverse, it's a privilege to carry forward this great brand and the reputation of Identiverse. As you know, Cyber Risk Alliance is a well-funded, rapidly growing business intelligence company serving the cybersecurity marketplace. In addition to Identiverse, we have several other leading information resources as part of our portfolio that include SC Media, Security Weekly, InfoSec World, and the Cybersecurity Collaborative. We intend to bring all of our assets and all of our resources to bear to build Identiverse into a preeminent and leading networking and learning event for everyone in this room. And with CRA's guidance, we have an excellent program over the next few days, and we're going to help carve the path to the future of identity, and I'll be here throughout. Andre, thank you for your passion, for your commitment. We all appreciate it deeply, and I think it's about time we get on with the show, as they say, and I know you've got some opening remarks to share with us, so let's get at it, partner. Doug, thank you for your partnership. We're going to crush it. Thank you. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, I want to introduce you guys all to your new digital twin. Uh, but before I do that, I need to do the setup. I need to get the setup. Why is the time for your digital twin now? So I'm going to talk about the inevitability of complexity. What is this thing we call trust? Jumping S-curves. And all of that is a lead in to what I think is next. So complexity happens, as you guys know, and the road to hell is paved with great intentions. But don't stress it, I've got good news for you. We just need to go faster, reduce costs, improve experiences, all while getting to the cloud. And oh, by the way, don't forget, somehow make it all invisible. <laughs> no big deal. Entropy is not on our side. So right now, we have more of everything. We have more identities, more silos, more policies, more roles, more groups, more permissions, more of everything that we need to somehow stitch together, get it to the cloud, and make it invisible. No small task. But don't worry, it gets better. We're all also being told that we can't trust anything anymore. So we're on this journey towards zero trust, verify always. The bad guys are already on the inside. Now what? So I want to take a moment and define trust because it's one of those really big words like zero trust and passwordless and we need to break it down. All right, so trust is the space that exists between what we hope will happen 
And what actually happens? What we hope will happen and what actually happens, we fill that void with trust. Now, we use other words at times, like hope, maybe on the extreme side, faith, but it is the gap between what we want to occur and what we know will actually occur. And it mostly works until it doesn't. But as security professionals, trust is a risky, risky strategy. We're paid to deliver security, not trust that we're secure. And we can't bet our careers and our companies and our brands on trust. So we're trying to shrink it. Ideally, we live in a world of small trust on our way to zero trust. It's a journey. A world where we could verify everything, verify always. But knowing is expensive. And so historically, while we would like to know, we couldn't afford to know, or we didn't have the technology to know. The continuous feedback loops that will inform the identity control plane on one simple question. Do we let the user in? So knowing is expensive. It's also complicated. And again, it requires more. More signals, more integration, more monitoring of those signals, more remediation of the signals when they say something is not right, which means more decisions. And more decisions means more complexity. So it's great to think that we would verify everything, but again, complexity is at the core of what we're ultimately trying to grapple with. And look, there's a lot of reasons for complexity. Obviously, asking us to connect everything and everyone together securely across our entire universe is no small task. It gets harder when we have proprietary systems because this is fundamentally a networked technology. We're connecting everyone to everything. And when we have proprietary systems, it gets in the way. We have to now develop proprietary and custom integrations. And then we got to maintain those integrations. And that makes things difficult and adds to our complexity. In addition to that, every new paradigm that we get excited about that solves some new problem, and I'm going to introduce one here in a little bit, doesn't necessarily negate or get rid of everything that we've done before. So we've got a layered cake or a multi-generational IT reality. And we're trying to draw a steel thread of consistency of identity through that multi-layered, multi-generational stack. And oh, by the way, it's hybrid now. So we got stuff on-prem, in the private cloud, in the public cloud, in multiple public clouds, again, adding to our complexity. We also have to deal with a lot of silos. And for many of us that have grown through acquisition and never taken the time and effort to actually do the integration and allow those things to persist, creates yet another silo. We're being asked to integrate the silo. We're being asked to improve the end user experiences because they don't want to feel your silos. They don't want to feel the friction and you are trying to create seamless, frictionless interactions for all of your constituents. The identity control plane needs to be seamless. So the silos get in the way and add to our complexity. Tech not built for scale. Here's an observation. Why is it that the simple things built for speed are the ones that become ubiquitous and then all of a sudden, in the later stages, we now need to figure out how to manage it. But things were never originally designed for scale. When we design things for scale, they're too complicated to get started. <laughs> and everyone throws them out. Like version one, great idea, too complicated. It's like version two, version three of the spec where we strip out everything that we didn't need and it gets simple enough for people to actually do. That's the thing that grabs hold. Then all of a sudden it becomes ubiquitous 
And then all of a sudden, we've created the next challenge of how do we manage it all? This cycle just keeps repeating. We design things for speed and simplicity. Everyone jumps on. It becomes ubiquitous. And then at scale, all of a sudden, we have to manage it. And it becomes tough, adding to the complexity. So I am optimistic. We've managed this curve many times over, right? And so in the identity space, we had the complexity of lots of logins. We wanted to centralize authentication and enable standards-based single sign-on from a central location. We created SAML and OIDC and other protocols. And we largely have achieved single sign-on within our fiefdoms and between our companies. We wanted to appropriately authorize and standardize the way in which we accessed APIs. We created new standards for that. We're at a stage right now, kind of the later stage of the authentication journey. We're trying to get rid of passwords, and we're going to succeed. We are definitely going to succeed. We also have the challenge of a lot of custom cement in our systems. We wire and stitch everything together through the APIs. And the day we deliver it, it's outdated. And we want to move the project teams to something else, but they're stuck. And they're especially stuck right now because identity is no longer static. And we can't control a dynamic world with static controls. And because identity is now the gate, it's the thing that's attacked. And the thing that's attacked has to be agile. And the expectations of user experience aren't static. And we're taking our consumerism and our experiences in identity in our consumer world, and we're expecting the same inside of our companies. So orchestration is coming along to help tackle that one. But wait, we're starting to see the later stages where things are getting really hard and really complicated. We're trying to fix the problem of privacy through regulation. That's going to be really hard. And it's happening. Whether we like it or not, if you're a global organization and you're now wondering, how do I keep track with all the privacy legislation? GDPR was just the beginning. And if you're being forced with industry-specific consortiums to open up your APIs, to allow interoperability of secure accessibility to your APIs. Oh, yeah, but by the way, capture the user's consent to share their information, and then enforce that consent all the way down to the field of data through the systems, all the various systems you have. It's getting really complicated. And what I've observed is that at the later stages of a paradigm, when it gets really, really hard, you typically are right on the cusp of a new approach a new breakthrough, a new S-curve. And so if you step back and think about what we're really doing right now, I would say we're somewhere down the throes of attempting to centralize the identity control plane within our companies. We're centralizing privileged access management, identity governance, authentication. We'd love to centralize our authorization policies and enforce them everywhere in a distributed world. We are somewhere down the curve of getting control of this identity control plane is the foundation for zero trust, verify always, only strongly authenticated users and appropriately authorized users can gain access to, to systems, no matter where they are, no matter where the individual is. But right on the cusp of where that gets really difficult, and the things that we really want to get to get difficult, all of a sudden, there's a new paradigm. And I think I've observed that at any moment in time, the world and life maintain a universal balance. And if there's something pursuing the extreme on a wave on one end, there's something cropping up on the other. It's the equal and opposite. I don't know that this is the equal and opposite, but can I suggest that decentralized identity can solve some challenges that heretofore have been really challenging with the paradigm and approach that we've been taking? So at the center of all of this complexity lies a super simple concept. We're simply trying to manage and maintain who has access to what 
at the center of everything is you. You are the central actor. The single most important construct in identity is you. And there's only one of you. There's only one of you. A lot of our problems manifest because in our reality, there are actually many of you. There's one physical you, there's many yous in the digital world. And that creates complexity, friction, redundancy. Networking systems hate redundancy. They're going to drive cost out. It's a matter of time. Everything's got to be better, faster, and cheaper in the future. So here's our reality. You and I are users. Go back to Tron. We're users. We're users of other companies' identity and access management systems that manage and maintain our digital identity on our behalf. So here's you, the user. One physical you, many digital yous, interacting with many identity systems, essentially to gain access to things that you want to gain access to. So you, the user, I'm going to argue you are a second-class digital citizen. Not a first-class digital, you are a second-class digital citizen. Because you don't control the way in which a lot of those users and the user information about you is shared. And as a result, we impart regulation telling companies you're not supposed to do that, or you need to capture the consent to do that, and then you need to enforce the consent, adding more complexity and overhead to a model that is fundamentally broken. Could I suggest that you are an individual, not a user? It sounds subtle. It is subtle, but it's profound. You, the individual, not you, the user, is a first-class digital citizen in a digital world. So here I would like to introduce the notion of your digital twin. The notion of your digital twin. And here's the reason why the time is now. Smart devices are now so ubiquitous that physical and digital are nearly the same thing. And the IT and OT world will collide and converge around this thing we call the smart device. It's always with us. It's always connected. It's always on. And with that device, we now have compute. And with compute, we can do things with and for our own digital identity that we couldn't do before. We had to have others do it for us. We have a secure enclave. We have embedded biometrics. We have standards to access those biometrics so that we can digitally unlock with our face a secure enclave that can store information about us. So through these smart devices, we're going to graduate. We're going to graduate from users to individuals, we're going to become first-class digital citizens. And we're going to put ourselves in the middle of transactions, not on the outside looking in, asking for consent and consent enforcement. And there's a new vernacular here that we're going to have to learn. We're going to collect credentials from credential issuers. We're going to store them on our, in our identity wallets. We're going to share them with relying parties, now called verifiers, who can verify the accuracy and authenticity of those digital claims that have been shared with us, stored on our smart device. So going forward, there's a whole slew of new things that we can do. Present evidence that you're worthy and be granted what you need, because you're carrying the evidence with you. That's a new day. That's a new paradigm. It's going to change a lot of different flows. So how do we get here? Share just a couple of thoughts about that. It needs to be a binding event. 
of the physical you to the digital you singular. And on that binding event, I want to introduce another notion, the notion of a cradle-to-grave identity. This is a new notion. You have one body, cradle-to-grave. You don't have one digital representation of you, cradle-to-grave. Now, we approximate certain things that are long-lived in our digital identity. For example, no one wants to give up their email address, not once they've had it a while. No one wants to give up their phone number, especially if you've got a good one and you've had it a while, because those are the ways in which people know that they can interact with you. And so we like the long-lived nature, if you will, of an identifier that is globally unique that allows people to contact us. This is more profound and more foundational a concept than an email identifier or a phone number that you keep. So there needs to be a binding event. And then over time, we're going to collect and share digital credentials, information about us in 360 degrees. We're going to collect that information and own and control the dissemination of it. Better control, better privacy. Third and most important leg to a three-leg stool that's only had two legs for 50 years. And as I said, it's going to allow us to manage our privacy. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to create a whole slew of new problems <laughs> that we're going to have to overcome together. There is no paradigm that's the panacea. There is only the paradigm that addresses the next set of challenges that the old paradigm finds very difficult, wasn't designed for, or the precursors to enable the new paradigm weren't present. It wasn't until the ubiquity of our ability to carry compute that we can enact or enable this new model. This is what we are doing at Ping with Showcard. And we need to make this smooth. The Sidewinder missile of a new paradigm can't blow everything up that we have working today. We are simultaneously centralizing the identity control plane within our control, and individuals will now have ability to decentralize and store their digital identity on their smart device in their pocket. And I encourage you all to show up to tomorrow's keynote where Microsoft is going to share some very, very interesting demonstrations of how this will all work. So with that, I would just like to encourage you all, this is the place that makes reality. I stood on this stage many years ago talking about SAML <laughs> and then talking about OAuth and OIDC and other standards that were going to enable and unlock the challenges of the day. But I also encourage you to embrace the new. We all must embrace the new. There are new standards. There are new flows. We will have to break some of our models and some of our thoughts of the way things used to work and open our minds and create space for the way things could be. The world is run by those who show up and hustle. You guys are all here. Thank you for showing up. It's been my pleasure to serve this community. I hope to serve it for many more years to come in partnership with CRA. And with that, have a wonderful week. Thank you.